Brooklyn Independent Television. Why don't we just agree to Yeah, that's really going to fly. Well, that's a good question. No, 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 no. Listen. That's exactly the point I wanted to make. I do, actually. I think this is freedom of expression just as this is freedom of expression. Do you really? I do, yes. And who are you? Who are you? My name is Pamela. Okay. Can you get out the way, Pamela? No. no. Oh, you're Pamela Gilla. No. No, which Pamela tell are you me, then? Tell me, Mona. What get out of my way. do you have to violate free speech? I'm not you violating it. I'm making an expression, expression on free speech. No, you're not. If you don't want to yourself, you should get out no, of my you way. No, you do not have to lie. I do, actually, and I'm doing it right now. And you should get out of my way. Do you want paint on yourself? Do you really? Okay, fine. Excellent. Defend racism. Defend racism. That's you right. have a lot of nerve. Put your body between me and you racism. You have a lot of nerve. Oh, yeah. Mona. No, I don't have nerve. You know what I have? I have an understanding of racism. You are violating free speech, I'm Mona. not. It's clear. I'm not you violating. You are violating I am, free speech. I am expressing myself freely against hate and racism. This was an approved death, Mona. I really don't care. Approved death. Yeah. Who are you arresting me for? Tell me. Tell me what you're arresting me for. Is everybody watching? What is he arresting me for? Yeah? Well, tell me what it is. I want to know what the charge is. I seriously want to do the charge. This is what happens to non-violent protesters in America in 2012. You can insert somebody's eye by spraying. She got in my way. She got in my way. I will continue to non-violently protest hate. And that is hate and racism. This is what happens in America when you non-violently protest. That's true. <laughs> the video we just showed you isn't a pair of real housewives duking it out for the cameras. Egyptian-American journalist Mona el Tahale was arrested for defacing a poster like this one in the subway. Paid for by the American Freedom Defense Initiative, it reads, In any war between the civilized man and the savage, support the civilized man. Support Israel. Defeat Jihad. This is Intersect, and today we're talking Muslim rage. I'm joined by Cyrus McGoldrick, the Advocacy Director at the Council on American Islamic Relations of New York, and Linda Sarsour, the Executive Director of the Arab American Association of New York. So we just saw this video that was down in the subway in, uh, I believe it was at 42nd Street. But there are 10 of these posters all around the city. I don't know that there is one in Brooklyn in particular. I think they're I all think so. in Manhattan, up mm -hmm. and down the island. But 10 posters, $6,000. There was some controversy over the thing because the MTA didn't want to put them up and there was a legal challenge. Uh, and this organization that... I have to remind myself of the American Freedom Defense Initiative paid for these uh, $6,000 ads. Yeah. So is this making your job more difficult or is this a gateway to talking about things? Linda? I mean, uh, the ads are in, uh, you know, like you said, in 10 train stations and Brooklynites are work in Manhattan. We, right. we shop in Manhattan, so we're obviously uh, able to see these and so, so, so do all other New Yorkers. Um, Pamela Geller, who is the woman behind um, these ads, uh, it has the right to be a racist and a bigot. She also has the freedom of speech to put up those ads. And we have the right to respond and we have the right to speak out against um, the hate that she's bringing in. But she's also trying to divert our attention as a community. Um, we have a lot of other focuses like the unwarranted surveillance of the Muslim American community by New York Police Department. Mm -hmm. um, we also have an election coming up and we are mobilizing our community to go to the polls. So she's uh, known for this uh, kind of putting a wrench uh, in our path, but uh, she continues to motivate us to keep doing the work that we're doing. Uh, like Linda said, there's lots of issues facing New Yorkers in general and your community specifically. So where does this sort of go in the scale of importance of those things like police and uh, infiltrating communities? And where did you place this in terms of importance? Yeah. No, I mean, a little bit of hate speech certainly doesn't, I think, compare to the very personal, you know, very physical, you know, 
experiences that Muslim Americans are having. Right. Um, but I think it does, you know, raise good opportunity to talk about, you know, who this person is, what this type of speech is, you know, the context that it's in within colonialism generally and discrimination in this country specifically. Um, and this character, you know, Pamela Geller, we've seen her before. This was the woman who was leading the charge against the mosque at Park 51 um, two years ago uh, during the midterm elections. Right. Um, this is the type of rhetoric that, you know, really provides a platform for surveillance, you know, and, and gives a justification uh, for surveillance and for war and for torture and indefinite detention and all of the things that people are going through now. And so it's important, you know, to analyze, you know, this moment, you know, to take this opportunity because we could have ignored them. Ten ads, we realized that I was out there, you know, handing out flyers last Monday when they went up. Most yeah. people weren't even looking at the stupid ads. Yeah. But it's important to really draw the line and make sure this rhetoric isn't infiltrating our politics and our media as well. So, speaking about that, if these ads serve any positive purpose, it may be for us to finally open a dialogue and not be afraid of the word jihad. Mm -hmm rightly or wrongly, whatever you think of the ads. So I'm gonna ask you guys to define what jihad is from your perspective. Sure. The, it's a complicated term, but one that's very central mm -hmm. to Islam. I think most generally to encapsulate all the meanings is it's a struggle for dignity, whether that's a personal dignity um, in your own faith, in your own spirituality and elevating yourself, or on a societal level, you know, in a search and in a, a struggle for people's rights, for people's sovereignty, for people's basically dignity. And so jihad, you know, certainly people have different interpretations of it. Uh, there's long 1400 years of legal traditions going back and forth about the, um, the times and places and means of you know, waging said jihad. Yeah. Um, but it's an important concept. You know, if we, you know, what I'm more concerned about than people like Pamela Geller throwing this word around is when Muslims feel targeted for this word and take it out of our vocabulary. You know, yeah. we, it comes to the point where you we criminalize our own language. Theory. Yeah, exactly. We internalize yeah. this stuff. And so it's important that we, uh, you know, really reclaim this. And uh, there's actually, in fact, been a great Twitter campaign, which I'll let uh, uh, Linda talk about, that's been, you know, crucial, I think, and a, a good example of an effort to really do that. But. He opened the door, Linda. Walk yes. You know, the kind of millennials or Muslim um, millennials um, uh, or millennials in general are known to be apathetic and just kind of don't really care about anything and just care about today. But the right. Muslim millennials and our friends have uh, waged a couple of uh, Twitter campaigns in the past uh, week, one included one called the My Subway ad basically uh, inviting people to say, what would you like to see on a subway ad? And it could be something, you know, in satire or it could be something serious. Right. Um, and there's also a, a recent uh, uh, hashtag on Twitter called My Jihad. You know, what is, what is your jihad? What are, yeah. you, what, 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 what are you struggling um, for? And I, and, I, and I agree with Cyrus, you know, I want to reclaim, my, my, reclaim these words that have been taken from us. Words like jihad, like radical, like there are people that call me and Cyrus radical. Mm -hmm. You know what, Martin Luther King was a radical to people, so was Malcolm X, and if that's the the, if that's if, the, if, the, if that's the history of our radicals in this country, then I'm very happy and proud to be calling myself a radical. Yeah. So I think it's about our generation taking back the language and not allowing people to use words from our faith to against us and 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 instill fear in people of, of, of people like me and Cyrus. I mean, I'm from Brooklyn. I was born and raised Brooklyn. You know, I'm an American. Like I went to public school. I went to John Jay High School. And, and the fact that uh, people like Pamela Geller are trying to create an us versus them. Um, uh, paradigm is, is, is disgusting right. and we've seen it happen over and over in our yeah. history and when is our country gonna wake up and say listen we're gonna stop scapegoating communities we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna accept that our country is a diverse country that we have people of all faiths including Muslims the largest growing and the fastest growing religion in the world there are 1.5 billion of us in this world right. and if a couple of, uh, of, of Muslims even 50,000 100,000 you know uh, engage in some, some sort of violence if you do the arithmetic, as Bill Clinton would say, yeah. uh, it kind of doesn't really, it, it doesn't even make the charts um, when it comes to the, the general population of, of Muslims. It equate to the percentage of African Americans voting for Mitt Romney. <laughs> Basically, I mean, exactly. Like zero percent. There may be some votes in there, but percentage wise. Herman Cain might be one of them zero. and Alan West. That's all I, all I can think of. So with this issue of the anti-jihad posters, it's compounded by this movie, The Innocence of Muslims, and uh, the death of uh, an American ambassador in uh, Libya. And what else has happened this week? There was uh, the French ads, cartoons, the cartoons. In France. Yeah, so it's everything is compounded. Why do you right. think there's such an onslaught right now? 
it's interesting. I think that you know people have a sense of the stakes. You know, it's a it's a war. At least some people think so. Yeah. Some people think it's think of it as a war, which is framed in an us versus them. Mm -hmm. You know, because this isn't even a just a post 9-11 thing. I think what you talked about, Russians stopped being the bad guys in the early 90s. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, that's when you started seeing the Rambo movies, uh, you know, where he's fighting they Palestinians, you know, yeah. guys have kafia scars and things like that yeah. was a 90s thing, you know, post Gulf War uh, one thing. And so 9-11 certainly gave, you know, Americans a, a feeling of, you know, martyrdom that they, you know, a victimization. Yeah. And so they responded to that. But even after that, I think it's important to know, even after 9-11, the negative feelings towards Muslims and towards Islam were nowhere near, weren't half as bad as they were once Obama got elected. Mm -hmm. It was in 2010 that Time Magazine did the studies where they found out that 50 or 60 percent of Americans had negative views of Islam and Muslims, when it was only like 20 or 30 percent after 9-11. You know, there was, a, there was a propaganda machine to this. And so yeah. when we counter that, you know, when we're looking at all the images that are on the media today, because of course, you know, for as many, you know, negative stories about Muslims there are, out there in the world, there are plenty of good ones that don't make the cut. You know, they don't make the headlines, and there's an agenda to that as well. And so, for our part, we need to identify the problems for what they are and identify the institutionalization of discrimination for what it is. But then on the other hand, do our day-to-day -day work and just building relationships, building alliances. And I think Linda and I, through the work that we've been doing in New York, have great relationships with other faith communities, other political communities. Um, and that's always very rewarding, honestly, for all the the bad that's out there and the bad that we receive for this. So it's complicated, but we've got to do the best we can. Well, you talk about complicated, this concept of Muslim rage, and it goes yeah. back, it's before, I guess, the Newsweek cover. I think it was the November, I'm sorry, uh, September 24th cover of Newsweek, where it's in big <laughs> block letters like Muslim rage, and they launched this hashtag. Angry guys with beards. Yeah, and but that's the prevailing sense of things. So how do you counteract those feelings of Americans on the outside, or just the world, mm -hmm. we're being led to believe that there is this Muslim rage mm -hmm. and that it's a wave that's coming to anywhere where you're going to be pretty soon. They're going to be right. angry Muslims at the door. And we don't necessarily know what they want outside of just to end our way of life or to kill us. There is not <laughs> Hate any, us for our freedoms yeah, and all I, that. I, I don't know, yeah. and I pay attention. I don't know that I've heard of any objectives. It's sort of like the gay agenda where... There's an agenda, but what are the points? What are what are they trying to do? Mm -hmm. What what is happening with the Muslim rage? But how do you make these defenses or even appear somewhere to try to change people's minds or just enlighten them to your perspectives when you have to fight these images of people getting mad over a cartoon in the newspaper. And it's hard for us in America because we're so apathetic about mm -hmm. those things, especially when it comes to religion. For the broader sense of America, I couldn't imagine what it would take to make 10 people, let alone 10,000 people, show up at the Barclay Center or something and <laughs> break out the windows because somebody made a cartoon of Jesus right, right. digging a booger out of his nose. Mm -hmm. Why, why, how do we reconcile those two things? I think that, um, you know, I, I get, I, I, I think we also look at things in a kind of an isolated way um, and I, as, a, as isolated incidents. But when you look at what's happening in the Middle East right now, our media is really schizophrenic. You know, mm -hmm. we've lived over a year and a half, you know, vicariously through uh, revolutionaries in Egypt. You know, we were rooting them on from the United States of America saying, wow, look at the Arabs across the world, the Arab Spring, yeah. we're inspired. And people are like, yes, pro-democracy. And then all of a sudden, in a shift of a week, suddenly we're, you know, Newsweek and other, and even many mainstream, uh, you know, media outlets, the headlines are, you know, these angry, you know, Muslims with beards and fire waging behind them. Yeah. So I think that, you know, we need to also uh, sometimes blame the media for where they focus their energies. Uh, you know, on the on the you know the violence and even just the protest, the fact that we were focusing on just some the violent act, there were protests with hundreds of thousands of Muslims, and the 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 issue is is that we need to look at that it's not just about a film. Yeah, it's about aggressive foreign policy, the U.S. foreign policy in that part of the world. We're still in a war in Afghanistan for the past ten years. Right. We. Uh, you know, it was a war, 650,000, if not more, Iraqis have died, you know, um, in the past, you know, eight years, looking at our, our very biased foreign policy when it comes to Israel-Palestine, um, trillions of dollars going into war and military aid for, for Israel. I mean, people have to understand this is long-term suppressed anger of a people, mm -hmm. and sometimes it takes one thing to kind of 
you know, the, 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 the last drop of the water, mm -hmm. you know, the cup of water, and it kind of overspills. And I think we need to really think about that um, as Americans, is about how our perception is now um, in, in, in the Middle East. And then also continuing to support the pro-democracy movements of, of the Arab world. Um, and I think that that's, that's important. But I also don't want to defend, you know, the violence um, in, 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 in anywhere in the world. Right. Um, I shouldn't have to defend, you know, uh, every Muslim that commits an act of violence, just like not, not every, you know, Christian or even white supremacist has to defend uh, Michael Page, who went into a, a, a Sikh Sikh. temple just last month and massacred, you know, six people, including a police officer. Uh, and I think there's so much responsibility put on our community to have to defend these acts. I don't, I don't represent every, bill, you know, 1.5 billion right. Muslims in the world, and neither should anyone else have to defend, you know, the faith that they come from. As long as I know that my faith doesn't promote violence, if there, you know, Islam doesn't promote violence, but there are Muslims who are going to engage in violence. That has not that there, there has to be a distinction between those two, and really look looking at what's happening in, in the Middle East in a bigger picture. Right. It's not just about one film or about one cartoon. Um, and the last point is the prophet, our prophet in Islam, is a fundamental, central part of our faith. And I think that there is an intention mm -hmm. to try to get at the fundamental, like the, the something the closest to our hearts, closest to our faith. And that is our prophet. So I, I think that there we need to really look at this in a more complex way than just say it's about a film or you know these angry Muslims and they're getting upset about a piece of paper with a cartoon on it. Yeah, it's it's, it's you know our, the mission is, is is hard and the stakes are very high. You know, mm -hmm. um, and of course you know we condemn the killing of diplomatic staff the same way we would condemning drone strikes in Pakistan or anything that takes an innocent life. Um, but yeah, it's important to, to show, you know, the double standards, to complete the history that is often left incomplete. And that's why it's so important and so special to have independent media and to have people who are willing to go beyond the headlines a little bit and to have these conversations and to show how it affects local people as well, because this is our community. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's going to, I know it's going to be very difficult because, you know, we are constantly accosted by these types of images and like just walking through the subway that's just one example and you'll note that you know people aren't ripping down coca-cola advertisements in the poster even though coca-cola is probably responsible for <laughs> enough loss of life as well the you know these ads are especially you know vitriolic they're especially yeah. poisonous you know for anybody who's walking it's just so obviously racist and colonialist that, so what do you think yeah. has happened that this court challenge was able to be won by uh the geller her organization. What do you think has happened in this country in the broader sense to make it all right? But what I believe is that people are using the word Muslim um, in in replacement of the word of the N word. So this mm. is so it's, it's in this country in the past ten years and most recently in the past couple of years, three years, we've seen that um, anti-Muslim rhetoric is acceptable. Yeah. We've seen elected officials, pundits um, talk about the radical Islamists and making up words that don't even yeah. exist in the in in, in Book, in, in our vocabulary language. or even yeah. in a dictionary, but seeing that, it, I mean, we've seen uh, congressional hearings held with our taxpayer dollars, over five of them in, 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 in uh, the Homeland Security Committee in Congress, about the radicalization of the Muslim American community and how we're the problem in this country, which, and we've had this fixation and obsession with extremism in the Muslim community, but then we, people like Page fall through the crack, cracks. He's been on the list of the Southern Poverty Law Center as well as the ADL Anti-Defamation League. Right. And this guy went into a Sikh temple with a gun and just shot up people. We look at the five, you know, white guys, anarchists in Ohio that were caught with explosives a couple of months ago. Well, they were white guys, and, yeah. and they were, and nobody called them terrorists, right? Suddenly they were the anarchists. Like that's a that's a, that's a thing. I mean, there's so many that people have to understand in this country that. While I'm all for freedom of speech, there has to be a, we have to draw the line because if hate speech gets you to the point where people are, you know, committing violent acts, we need to draw the line there. I mean, it just, I mean, recently we had a, a mosque in Joplin, Missouri, burned to the ground. Um, and then also to connect people like Pamela Geller um, and Robert Spencer to, for example, Anders Breivik, right, the Norway mm -hmm. terrorist. This guy went into a, a youth camp and just shot up over 70 people, right. um, murdered them. And when looking at his manifesto and looking at his blog and all the stuff that he puts out on the internet, he was citing people like Pamela Geller and Robert Spencer. He was telling you to go and you know and, and read them and stuff. check them out. Like I, you know, these are my people. 
and, yeah. and he massacred 70 people. So the fact that we're sitting back, and, if, and the other thing also is one, one last point is that if you take any of these situations and you flip them and put a Muslim in that situation, if it was a Muslim group putting up an ad like that, that potentially was... Uh, You've been hated. welcome yeah. to. She said, go spin your six out, don't deface my yeah. ad. That's yeah. not freedom of speech. And go there is a group, money. so the United Methodist Woman, so it's not mm -hmm. even a Muslim group. The United Methodist Woman is a, an organization who's going to be putting up ads. They should be going up in this, this, this coming week. Um, and the ad says, uh, hate speech is not civilized. Mm. Um, uh, work for peace through words and deed. And that's going to be their ad that's going to counter Pamela Geller. Um, and the other thing that we've told Pamela Geller, now told her this personally on a debate on BBC, I said to her, listen, we welcome criticism of Islam. We welcome dialogue on, on Islam. If you got a problem and you got some questions you need to ask, you ask then. Everyone should be welcome to do that. But what we don't welcome is demonization, vilification, and hate towards our, our, our faith. Um, and I think there's a difference. So she's not having, the, the woman that charges that we're the uncivilized well, is the one the that's uncivilized. Yeah. We're in New York. We're sitting here in Brooklyn right now. How do these issues play out in New York City and Brooklyn in particular. None of it happens in a vacuum, but I do think, like you mentioned, like you went to high school right here. You're a Brooklyn girl. We just heard it come out a moment ago. <laughs> yes. And to say that this is, this is your home, like this is where we are and we all relate to each other. We bump up against each other on the subway every day. And we are removed from those guys burning an effigy of the president somewhere in a place that's not near here, but we're still affected by those things. So how are these issues playing out right here in Brooklyn? Sure. I mean, I think we all have the personal responsibility mm -hmm. to make sure that we are you know, being the change, you know, as, it, as, it, as we say, to make sure that in our interactions with other people, you know, that we are respecting their humanity, of course, yeah. you know, because these things do play out in our personal relationships as well. But I think on a higher level and what this, even this poster situation highlights very nicely is how this and what may be free speech and what may be hate speech or in the overlap of the two, you know, how that relates to even, um, you know, government repression. You know, I think that, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating to me and I, and I love highlighting that, you know, Pamela Geller's free speech argument, her First Amendment argument kind of, you know, rings hollow when she's made her career off of trying to stop Muslims from exercising their property rights to build a house of worship. Mm -hmm. That's very ironic to me, and I think that people should understand. And then also reflect that if we appreciate these rights so much, there's a mosque in Brooklyn, in South Brooklyn, where people running for state assembly are writing letters to Bloomberg trying to get him to stop this mosque from being built. Like, are you serious, really? Like, this is, you know, to what level we are willing to erode our, constitu our, our American Constitution and our Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. you know, because of this demonization, because of this manufacturing of a threat, you know, it's very dangerous, you know, when we question, you know, our fellow human beings, we lose our principles, you know, and our respect and our dignity for each other and for ourselves. Because after, before Muslims, like we've been talking about, before Muslims, it was another group that was being demonized. And unfortunately, after Muslims, it will probably be another group that will be demonized. And for our part, I know we're doing this work not just to protect Muslims now, but to protect that next generation as well and to make sure that this does not happen to another group, that another group does not have the experience of, um, you know, whether it's internment or whether imprisonment or, or discrimination or whatever it is. And so it's very important. We all have a role there. You know, we need to make sure we hold our elected officials accountable, reminding them that they're public servants and they are not allowed to engage in this type of hate speech if they want to represent us. Right. And make sure that in our personal relationships that we're doing the best that we can you know, to elevate ourselves and our spirits. So you spoke about the mosque uh, that has been an ongoing sort of back and forth yeah. battle and the thing still isn't built and open. <laughs> and uh, we had, which seems like eons ago, the Ground Zero mosque yeah. as well. But we're also in a time where stop and frisk is affecting the sure. community in a very particular way, as well as just this whole monitoring situation. So just while we have you here, what are some of the issues that are facing the community right now that we should be aware of? Right now, the uh, Muslim American community um, in New York City um, and in Brooklyn um, have been working directly with communities have, that have been working on ending stop and frisk policies of the New York Police Department for many years before we came along. Uh, that we've been uh, really uh, connecting the dots, right? And the other thing also um, to make a point about Brooklyn Muslims is that a lot of people, when they think Muslim, they think people that look like me or people who are Pakistani or from South Asia. Yeah. 
over a third of uh, Muslims are African American. Right. And you look at b parts of uh, Brooklyn, like in the Bed Stuy area, you have you know Mashi Taqwa. It's just celebrated its 30 years. Yeah. Um, and the and the issues that our community um, is dealing with are real. Um, it includes the infiltration of our mosques by informants. Uh, the fact that our er, the where we eat, where we pray, where we play is being monitored by um, law enforcement. Um, the entrapment of young men um, in, in bogus terrorist plots, um, and people can go just kind of read more about them in right. more detail. Uh, and also the, you know, the, 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 the experiences that our young people are feeling in schools. I mean, bullying, um, young women that cover their hair being bullied in school, um, young people being told, oh, you know, your, uh, how do you feel your uncle got killed when Osama bin Laden? We had young kids, like fifth graders, telling us that their friends were telling them that are, we, are they sad because their uncle got killed. This is the kind of um, pressures of, uh, uh, that our community um, is facing um, right now. That, and that's compounded by some of the stuff that is happening to some Muslim family members that are across the world. I mean, we have mm -hmm. family, we have a, a Syrian community here. Their families are being massacred in Syria right now. Mm -hmm. We have Palestinians whose families are still living under military occupation. You have Pakistan. I mean, our, our issues are so much bigger than, um, than ourselves. And I think the way that we're going to win is by working with other communities. Uh, we were uh, a, a central in organizing of the silent march on Father's Day to end the discriminatory policies of the New York Police Department. We're working directly with co coalitions like Communities United for Police Reform to pass the Community Safety Act. We need accountability for the New York Police Department. It's my taxpayer dollars, it's your taxpayer dollars, it's Brooklynites taxpayer dollars yeah. are going to the New York Police Department. And we want to make sure that our money is being spent on making us safe, not targeting communities of color. Uh, so, so I think that uh, the, 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 the best thing that we could do as Brooklynites is to look at each other and say, you know, that all of our struggles are intertwined in some way. Um, and that's the only way that we're going to get past uh, the, the issues that we're uh, facing uh, as a community. And again, holding our elected officials accountable. We have an election coming up uh, in a, in a very soon. And my vote is going to someone who is going to stand up against hate. I, my vote is going to go to someone that doesn't that that believes that unwarranted surveillance of, of of communities is is illegal and wrong. That's where my vote is going, and I hope that Brooklynite to join us in making sure that they're they're voting for dignity and respect for all in New York City. Sure, um, we're the Council on American Islamic Relations in New York. You could find us online at care-ny.com. My organization is the Arab American Association of New York. You can find us online at arabamericanny.org, and again, follow me on Twitter at elsarsour and Cyrus at at Cyrus McGoldrick. We'll keep it interesting, for sure. <laughs> it's always interesting. <laughs> I'd like to thank my guest, Cyrus McGoldrick, of the Council on American Islamic Relations of New York, and Linda Sarsour of the Arab American Association of New York. Thanks for watching Intersect. We'll see you next time. Bye now. Watch this and other Brooklyn Independent Television episodes online at brickartsmedia.org slash BIT.